Human trafficking is very simple. It's the buying and selling of people. This happens on a worldwide basis. In principle, every country in the world is affected by trafficking. People will actually be bought and sold everywhere in the entire world. A trafficker will have four girls, five girls, five prostitutes working in a house in London, but next week he'll take one of them to Birmingham and one to Paris, and he'll bring one from Paris to London, and then he'll switch another one to Glasgow and take a girl from Glasgow to Amsterdam and, and because if you move people around you disorientate them and you don't allow them to build strength of relationship. If somebody is forcing a young girl to be here and uh, uh, they say to her if you talk about this, if you try to escape I kill your family, if she really believes that she's not going to talk about it. She will stay there until the day they let her free or until the day she feels strong enough to escape. So then there's not so much you can do, because maybe it really happens and you bring other people in danger. So you have to uh, let it be, and the only thing you can try to do is keep in touch with her and let her know that there are people or possibilities available. But you can only do that, you can only use those possibilities with approval of this lady. If you are human and if you come into contact with this, you have to be angry, because this is just so not right. This is not the way we're meant to be. Um, I think you're only able to uh, work as a prostitute or to make this decision if you're able to separate sex and love from each other. And uh, I never had any problems with it myself because um, uh, well, I didn't see any harm in it. I was quite a, well, a rebel uh, at that age, you know, I was only 16 and living a, quite a wild and, and crazy life, so it was typical me. Um, and I, I saw sex as a game, you know, it was not difficult for me at all to have sex with people without the whole complicated relationship bullshit around it. And um, it's also something, as soon as you are able to make this separation or to, to, to play this game, you get used to it really quickly. You know, after one day, you know, the first day that you sit here, maybe it's a bit hard. I still remember that I... I even was too afraid to stand up, you know, or to look at people. I was like, the curtains closed and a bit like this. But the second day, it's okay. Dutch police have uh, done some research and they're thinking that at least 60, but maybe 80 or even 90% of the women in Dutch prostitution is there on a forced basis. So they didn't choose it for themselves, no, they have been trafficked. Uh, they are forced to do prostitution. Um, imagine that people look down on you or that people see you as a victim, that people constantly look at you like you're a victim. It makes you feel really small and really vulnerable. And that's exactly what people do against sex workers. You know, if you sit here, for a lot of people it doesn't even matter if you're here uh, because you want to be here or you, you're here uh, against your will. People always look at you with pity in their eyes. Oh, sorry. Um, and that makes people um, uh, in the sex industry feel really, really um, well, small and vulnerable. It's a thing about human dignity. I think it's very, very important that we celebrate the dignity of a human being. And, well, the thing I said before, we are living in a country that celebrates freedom. We say we celebrate freedom. And still, in our own country, people are living in captivity and slavery. Um, on a regular level, there are campaigns to inform visitors. I mean, Amsterdam is also a sex tourism destination, and so it's important to actually inform those people uh, that come here for uh, the red light district, to inform them, guys, there are girls that work here that are not doing this voluntarily. These are the signals to look at. And this is where you go to if you actually have a suspicion that this happens. Usually if I hear about somebody that is forced to work in the window prostitution in the red light district, I hear this story from a customer. So I find it always really important to stay in touch with customers because it's a very important source of information. If they have a, a sex with somebody that is working against her will, you know, most of the customers feel responsible for that. And they don't want that and they want uh, help for this person so um, they can come over here and uh, from here um, I can send people into other directions like helping organizations or the police and um, it happened a couple of times that I made some phone calls myself about um, a girl 
that's the only thing I can do. I cannot go somewhere with my baseball bat and kick out the pins and rescue her, you know. It would be a great movie maybe, but it's not realistic to handle it that way. Yeah. But I know who to call if somebody's in trouble. Yeah. Any major sporting event, actually any major international event, is a magnet for traffickers. I'm not quite sure what the specific impact in South Africa will be, um, but I cannot imagine that a significantly increased demand will not affect the supply. In prostitution areas like the Red Light District, if there are big, big events, you have a lot of people that go to that area to party because mm -hmm. men, you know, they, they uh, are attracted by uh, sex, alcohol and, <laughs> and football. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if they make a combination of all those uh, issues in, in one area, you, you will see that it's extremely busy. I, I live in uh, England and in 2012, two years time, we're getting ready to host the Olympic Games and stop the traffic is already working alongside the serious organised crimes agency, soccer as they are called in the UK, and the London police force. We're sitting on several uh, committees, we're working a strategy um, because this is a big issue for London two years down the road and the traffickers are getting ready now, so we have to get ready too. Um, by now in, in Parliament we're working on a law to regulate prostitution and to, well, to attack uh, human trafficking. So that's a very important one. And in that one we um, force all local governments to make policy on prostitution. We force uh, 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 prostitutes to have a registration. And if uh, and when we want to raise the, um, the, the, the age for a prostitute from 18 to 21. So those are a few very concrete um, instruments to fight human trafficking in the Netherlands, uh, well, in prostitution. It is possible to be trafficked, to be forced into this, uh, but at the same time you work in, in legal uh, circumstances and, and visible for, for everybody. So the police can check your passport to find out your age and nationality, but they are not able to find out if you are trafficked or not. If you want to stop the traffic, First of all, you've got to spot the traffic. You've got to spot it to stop it. If you legalize sex work or if you legalize the working places, it's not a solution for trafficking. But if it's illegal, you make it easier for criminals to force people into this. You can significantly reduce trafficking. You can reduce it by making sure you're doing everything you possibly can as a nation, as communities and as individuals to make it harder and harder and harder for anybody who's involved in this crime to operate. So awareness raising is very important. I mean general awareness raising and that's why you've got to do it years and years out. Most trafficking in most communities happens because no one notice it, notices it. I think that as long as you will have evil people on the planet, you will have people willing to exploit others. But I do believe that if, as a society, we say we don't want this, you can drastically reduce the instances of this happening. And we, you can see it in the past. There have been many, many moments when we've said we don't want this to happen anymore, not in our society. And that's as simple as it is.